Well, good evening. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the University of East Anglia and this British Academy lecture. My name's Jonathan Dickens. I'm Professor of Social Work here at UEA, and I'm Director of our Centre for Research on Children and Families, CRCF. Our distinguished speaker today, Professor Susan Gollenbach, is from the University of Cambridge Centre for Family Research, CFR. So you can see the links and why it is a, a real great pleasure for me to welcome Susan today and to welcome you. Thank you very much for joining us, whether you are here in the Enterprise Centre or online, or in due course if you're watching the recording. For those of you who are attending live today, uh, there will be a question and answer opportunity after Susan has spoken. Uh, if, you're, if you're online, please use the chat, and I'll make sure that we do take a question from the chat. I know many of you will know Susan's work, and you want to hear her speak. But first, I have a word about our sponsors, the British Academy. The British Academy is the UK's National Academy for the Humanities and Social Sciences. It promotes these disciplines to help understand the world and shape a better future. They do this by investing in researchers and projects across the UK and overseas, engaging the public with fresh thinking and debates, and bringing together scholars, government, businesses, and civil society to influence policy for the benefit of everyone. So tonight's event forms part of the British Academy annual public lecture series, which was started in 1908. It's their flagship lecture programme to bring the very best scholarship in the humanities and social sciences to a wider audience. So that's why I'm delighted to welcome Professor Susan Gollenbach and you to the University of East Anglia this evening. Susan is Professor Emerita of Family Research and a former director of the Centre for Family Research at the University of Cambridge. And she's a fellow of the British Academy. Susan has pioneered research on lesbian mother families, gay father families, families with transgender parents, families formed by mothers who are single by choice, fathers who are single by choice, families created by assisted reproduction technologies, including IVF, donor insemination, egg donation, and surrogacy. She's led studies in the UK and internationally. Her research has challenged commonly held assumptions about these families, as well as challenging widely held assumptions about child development, the assumptions of experts and the courts. It's contributed to change in policy, in legislation, and in public attitudes, both in the UK and internationally. Her most recent book, of which we'll hear more in a moment, and there's an opportunity to buy one at the back of uh, the room, is entitled, We Are Family, What Really Matters for Parents and Children. So without further ado, it does give me immense pleasure to hand over to Professor Susan Gollenbach. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan, for that very warm welcome. It's an absolute pleasure and an honour to be here this evening representing the British Academy in this joint lecture um, with the British Psychological Society at UEA. Um, and it's a particular pleasure because I've been for decades very aware of the work here, of your School of Social Work, and the really groundbreaking research that has been done here over the years on vulnerable children and fostering and adoption and all kinds of areas sort of related to that in terms of parents and their families. So it's a special pleasure for that reason um, to be here tonight. So thank you. Um, so what I'm going to do tonight is give you a bit of a, a historical tour through the research. Um, when I first got involved in studying new families in the mid-1970s, then the family was very different to the family today. So that most children were brought up in the traditional nuclear family with married parents, 
who were biologically related to their children. Although in the 1970s there began to be an increase in divorce, divorce rates, divorced mothers and single mothers were still very much stigmatized in these days, and cohabitation was frowned upon. And it was only a few years earlier that um, homosexuality had been decriminalized and nobody had even heard of test tube babies. So it was a very different environment than it is today. And the traditional nuclear family, like the one in this picture, was the one that was held up as the gold standard and the one against which every other family type was compared. So I got involved in this area of research when the feminist magazine Spare Rib published an article in September 1976 on the fact that lesbian women were losing custody of their children when they and their former husbands divorced. And that was without exception. Um, by September 1976, not a single lesbian mother um, had won custody against her ex-husband. And it was particularly striking in these days because then custody was almost always awarded to mothers um, in preference to fathers. So the article went on to describe these custody disputes and what basically happened was that it was um, custody was fought on the basis of expert witnesses. So the expert on the mother's side generally arguing that what mattered most for children was the quality of family relationships. And then an expert on, on the father's side who uh, often would come from a, a more psychoanalytic perspective and would argue that the children um, were bound to experience psychological problems by growing up um, with a lesbian mother. And in the absence of any empirical research whatsoever on what actually happened to children in lesbian mother families, then judges tended to opt for what they saw um, was the kind of safe situation of awarding custody to the father, who by the time these cases got to court, generally had formed another um, traditional nuclear family. The kinds of issues um, or questions that were raised in these custody cases in these days, well, usually three um, things kept coming up. Firstly, that lesbian mothers were less nurturing than heterosexual mothers that the children would experience psychological problems. And also, there was concern in these days about children's gender development, that boys would be less masculine, girls less feminine than boys and girls in heterosexual homes. And in these days, in the mid-1970s, then that was seen as problematic. Um, the issue that always came up as well was would the children grow up to be lesbian or gay themselves? And again, that was seen by judges in the 1970s as a reason to not award custody to lesbian mothers. Um, and while these cases were playing out in the UK, the same was happening in the United States. One of the um, most shocking of those occurred as late as 1995 in Florida, um, where a man who had shot his first wife was given custody over a lesbian mother and her partner. So he was interviewed on television. He said, just talking about his, his former wife, I shot her three times in the upper left shoulder. She told me not to kill her. She would give me the baby and a divorce. I fired three times point blank into the heart. I reloaded and shot her six more times. And the judge, in summing up, said, I believe that this child should be given the opportunity and the option to live in a non-lesbian world. And that was in the US in 1995. So in this original spare rib article, one of the mothers who had been interviewed, who'd lost her children, called for somebody to come forward and do some research. Um, and when I read this, I really wanted to do this research because I was just, I was a young master's student, just, you know, as one does, looking around for a master's project. I was interested um, in the women's movement, and so 
this project to me just seemed, um, you know, just like a wonderful opportunity to do something that combined two of my passions at the time. Um, so I sort of plucked up the courage and I, I called the organization who were named in the article and I went to see them and um, after, after giving me quite a tough interview, they, they said that, um, you know, they sort of trusted me to do independent research and then they helped me find families who would take part. So, um, in that first study, we found um, the children were no different and the mothers were no different from our comparison group of single mother families. Um, so, the lesbian mothers were just as warm, involved and committed to their children. Um, the children were no more likely to experience problems and there was no differences in the children's gender development. And actually, there were two other studies that were conducted in the United States at the same time with exactly different samples, exactly the same findings. And then, um, as some of you will remember, in 1988, Margaret Thatcher's government brought in the infamous Section 28, which stopped um, local authorities, that is schools, promoting homosexuality, and the act described um, lesbian mother families or gay father families as pretended family relationships. So that was a further setback in terms of same-sex parents in these days. So um, partly because of that, and just partly because of some of the criticisms that have been leveled against the research, we decided to follow up the children as adults. So when we first saw them, they were aged around 10 or 11. And with my colleague Fiona Tasker, we went back to see them when the children were adults. So they were around age 24, 25 years old. Because although our earlier research found that these children were, were doing very well, then critics argued, oh, well, they might be fine as children, but it's, it's when they grow up that they're going to have problems because of their upbringing. So we followed them up. Um, we found that they had very positive relationships with their mothers and also with their fathers, those who were still in touch with them. And in fact, the young adults and lesbian mother families had much better relationships with their mother's new partner than did those in single heterosexual mother families who by then all but one had a stepfather. Um, and that relationship didn't work out so well. They also showed high levels of psychological well-being, and because the issue of sexual orientation came up in every single custody case, we looked at that too. And in fact, we found that the large majority um, of young people in lesbian mother families identified as heterosexual. They were more likely to um, have same-sex relationships um, while growing up than those in the um, heterosexual mother families, um, most likely because it wasn't so stigmatized in their family. Um, but in terms of their identity, then by their mid-20s, it turned out that actually most of them did identify as heterosexual. There's only been one other study that has followed children up to look at this, and I'll, I'll come with actually rather similar findings, but I think with more liberal attitudes these days than um, young people obviously feel freer to pursue the relationships they want to pursue. So um, all of this in terms of custody was really happening below the radar. So it wasn't until 1978 that the UK public became aware of lesbian women raising children. And this happens in an article, um, an expose in the newspaper, the Even London Evening News which um, exposed a Harley Street doctor who was offering donor insemination to lesbian couples. And this caused a huge furore, questions in the House of Commons, questions in, in the House of Lords, called for these babies to be banned. Um, so that then prompted a series of other studies, both by my own team, but also in the US and other parts of Europe, because it was argued um, that the research that had been done so far couldn't be generalized to children growing up in lesbian mother families right from birth. Um, and, but in fact, the studies that were carried out came to exactly the same conclusions. <laughs> 
And then another criticism of the research, um, and, and these were perfectly you know, legitimate criticisms, was that the early studies were reliant on volunteer convenient samples because it wasn't possible to study representative samples of lesbian mother families. But that changed in the 1990s when um, we were able to work with the Avon Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children in the West of England. And also, um, when we worked with seven, families with seven-year-olds, and Charlotte Patterson, her group in the United States, did a similar thing with a very large epidemiological study there, a study of 14-year-olds. Uh, and we found, just as with all the earlier research, that in fact the children, again, um, were doing well and with even with representative samples, the findings were the same. Now, 1978 was a big year for new family forms because it was also the year in which Louise Brown, the first test tube baby, was born. Um, and again, although in some ways um, her birth was seen as a scientific breakthrough, there was also quite a lot of criticism um, of, of children being born through in vitro fertilization as well. In the early days, um, there, were, there was quite a, oh, actually, before I say that, yes, I'll show you this. This is interesting. I discovered this quite recently. This is, people talk about um, children being conceived in test tubes. This was actually the Petri dish, which is now at the Science Museum, in which some of the very first IVF babies were conceived. So it, it looks, I mean, it, it's all presented as so high tech. It actually looks very low tech and really quite old fashioned, but uh, there it is. So I, want, I wanted to show you that. Um, so yes, in the early days, you know, there was talk about, or newspaper headlines about Frankenstein children, you know, the idea that these children would have um, problems in some way, maybe physical, mental, though some newspapers um, reported people thinking they, these children may not have a soul and, you know, all kinds of uh, speculation, imagination about how these children might be different. Um, and then there were more sort of prosaic concerns so that the idea that these parents who'd experienced years of infertility might be very overprotective of their children once they were eventually born or they might set too high standards for themselves as parents or of their children. Um, but, I mean, with in vitro fertilization, the children are born with the eggs and sperm of the mum and dad who will be their parents and bring them up. But somewhat more controversially, um, and certainly more interesting from a psychological perspective, is when children are born through third-party reproduction. So either through donor sperm, donor eggs, donor embryos. Um, so these children lack a genetic link to either their mother, their father, or both parents, depending on the use of eggs and or sperm. And there was, in the early days, there was concern that the non-genetic parent may not fully accept the child as their own child. And there's also been, and this is still an ongoing debate, about the potentially negative effect of secrecy, not telling children about their conception. Um, and so the idea is that secrecy um, could interfere with those in the family who know the secret, in this case the parents, and those who don't know the child. So, um, you know, again, you know, nothing was known about these families. So we began a study of children born around 1985. So this was the first cohort of IVF children to be studied from a psychological perspective. We collaborated with um, three other European studies, Italy, Spain, and the Netherlands, and we followed up more than 100 IVF families, 100, more than 100 families with children conceived by donor insemination, and we studied them in comparison with adoptive families and where the children had been adopted very early on in early infancy, and also natural conception families. And this um, was a longitudinal study, so we studied the families when the children were 6, 12, and 18 years old. And in spite of um, the worries and fears that had been expressed about these children, we actually found the opposite, that where there were differences, the parents in the assisted reproduction families 
showed higher levels of warmth, involvement with their children, interaction with their children, than the comparison group of natural conception children, um, with the adoptive families sort of falling in between. And in terms of the children, they were um, you know, showing very high levels of psychological well-being. But one thing that was um, very, well, maybe not so surprising, but certainly in some ways quite shocking, was that not one set of the 111 families with children born through donor insemination had told their children about their conception. And by the time the children were 12, only well, something like 8% of parents had done so. And we asked the parents why they weren't being open with their children. And it was mainly a concern that the child had a good relationship with the parents and that by telling them that this would somehow interfere with that relationship. Many parents felt by the time the children were six, they kind of regretted not telling them, but they felt it would, they'd left it too late. It would be too much of a bombshell to tell them at that point. So one issue, one question we were really interested in is you know, looking at the psychological consequences of openness versus secrecy, which we couldn't do in our first study. So we then began a new study 15 years later at the time of the millennium. Um, and we just focused on children born through some kind of reproductive donation. So sperm donation, egg donation, um, and with a comparison group of uh, families formed through unassisted conception. This study began said in the year 2000 when the children were one. We have seen them now seven times, um, when they were one, two, three, seven, 10, and 14, and most recently when they were 21. Um, so it's been quite a long, longitudinal study, and um, we haven't quite finished analyzing our 21-year-old data yet, but I'll tell you a little bit about the earlier phases. So in terms of the preschool years, um, in fact, the findings replicated the first our European study, which found um, where there were differences, more positive relationships in the assisted reproduction families, and the children were doing very well. When we went back at age seven, um, now as many of you will know, you know, by when children make this transition to school around age six to seven, their understanding of, of things like genetic inheritance becomes more sophisticated, more complex, and they understand adoption better. So it's a kind of age at which, um, you know, they, they, they know more about not just the positive, but perhaps the more negative side of, for example, being adopted or not having a genetic link to a parent. So um, many of the parents had said to us that they were, you know, had been very worried about talking to their children about their donor conception. But all of those who had said, well, in fact, it was a great relief because, you know, our fears were unfounded. Our children either weren't very interested or they were curious, but actually not one set of parents reported um, problems or distress in the children when they began to talk to them about their conception. We did find at age seven um, more positive mother-child relationships in families where the parents had been open with their children about their conception. Um, now, one explanation for that could be these were just more open families generally, rather than being open about that specific issue. But actually, at 10, when we went back, we did measure openness of communication in the family as well, and that didn't seem to be what was driving this. Um, but the children were doing well. So then, uh, when the children were teenagers, um, it was actually we found that those who'd been told early, so that is most of the parents who told their children had done so, begun to do so by the time they were four years old. And we found that those who begun to tell their children by age four had better relationships with their children as teenagers. And what was interesting about this was that we, this was from data we collected independently from the mothers and from the adolescents themselves. Um, so each kind of um, validated what the others said. And 
most of the children, we also, in our research, we like to speak to the children and ask them um, what they feel and think about their families. And most of them were unconcerned about their conception. Um, this child said, I don't think it really affects anything. My dad is still my dad. And that really represents the feeling among the children. Now, um, as I'm sure many of you will know, in this country, the law changed in 2005, which means that children born since that time by donor conception are legally entitled to find out the identity of their donor on reaching age 18. So at the time, it seems like a long way away, but actually we're now talking about um, next year when the first children will be able to go to the Human Fertilization Embryology Authority and ask who their donor is. So we were interested in, in a way, sort of preparing ourselves, what is it that these young people might want to know? Um, and so we, we did a study, we collaborated with the Donor Sibling Registry in the United States, um, which is a registry to help donor conceive young people and donor siblings to try and um, make contact with each other. And the three things that the young people most wanted to find out are, so this was about children born through sperm donation because egg donation happened a bit later. Do I look like him, my donor? Is my personality like his? And also what is his family background, his family history? Um, but the young people wanted to find out about the donor because they wanted information. Most of them didn't particularly want an ongoing relationship with their donor. They were much more interested in their donor siblings. So these are genetic half-siblings born from the same donor but growing up in different families. And many of the children were really pleased to meet donor siblings. They were often only children. Um, and their donor siblings were often of very similar age to themselves. And some of them um, formed and maintained very close relationships with their donor siblings, which is something that was sort of unexpected. We, we hadn't really thought too much about that until we did this study. Again, in this study, um, so again, this was largely an American sample um, with different methods, but we did find this effect of age of telling. Um, I'm just going to give you two quotes just to um, represent the kinds of things that they were saying to us. But again, we found those who had been told about their conception when they were young were much more accepting than those who found out later. Um, which, you know, I know that you're all experts, and many of you on adoption, so this will make sense um, because it's really very consistent with that. But, um, for example, Anna who, um, was age 13 at the time, um, and she found, when she took part in the research, she found out when she was four about her donor conception, she said, I've always been accepting of it because I never knew any different. Whereas Mandy, who was 19 um, and found out at age 12, said, it was one of the most shocking and upsetting experiences of my life. I felt alone. Okay, so now um, I'd like to turn to probably one of the most controversial kinds of assisted reproduction, surrogacy. Some of you in the audience um, will, might remember this was Kim Cotton, the Britain's first surrogate mother in 1985. Um, and when it was discovered by the press that she had conceived a baby for another couple for money, um, there was huge outrage um, and I mean she was vilified for doing this and the baby was immediately taken away from her and it was it was just um, you know it was just constant in sort of Daily Mail and, and other tabloids at the time. So as a response to this the government rushed in the Surrogacy Arrangements Act in 1985 to ban commercial surrogacy and the thought was surrogacy will go away. If women are not being paid to have babies um, as surrogates, then nobody will want to do it. But that's not actually what happened. And over the years, the rates of surrogacy births increased. Um, and in 1998, then, well, actually in 1997, um, the government set up a new committee, one, and I was on this 
particular committee to look at different aspects of how surrogacy was practiced in the UK, and that produced the Brazier Report in 1998. And as part of that, just partly by being on this um, committee, it made me see surrogacy differently, but it also made me realize that, you know, just as had happened with assisted reproduction and, and lesbian mother families before that, people had very strong opinions and assumptions and prejudices without any empirical data on what actually happened in surrogacy families. Um, and in particular, in terms of the children, a number of questions have been raised but um, these hadn't been formally studied. So for example, are children psychologically harmed by the knowledge that they've been created with the sole purpose of being given away to other parents? And what if large sums of money changed hands? How would they feel then? Also, who do they see as their real mother? So is it the surrogate who gave birth to them or is it the intended mother who brings them up? What if the surrogate is actually, if her egg was used and she's the genetic mother, does that make a difference? And also, if the surrogate remains in contact with the family as the child grows up, does that undermine the intended mother's feelings of entitlement as a parent? Does it in some way undermine her parenting? So these were the kinds of questions that were being raised and really nobody knew the answers. So as part of our longitudinal study, we, we included another group of surrogacy families. And we were very lucky to be able to work with the Office of National Statistics because when intended parents become the legal parents of a child born through surrogacy, they're awarded what's called a parental order and that's registered um, and the Office of National Statistics keeps track. So the, the Office of National Statistics um, agreed to collaborate with us and help with recruitment, which meant that we ended up with um, a, a pretty representative sample of surrogacy families. And again, we followed them up at exactly the same time as with our other longitudinal study. Um, and again, we found certainly in the preschool years, again, very positive outcomes. We did find um, for the children, there was a bit of a blip in terms of their psychological adjustment around age seven. So we found that for the surrogacy children, they showed, I mean, they were all, fun, they weren't children with severe problems. So, but compared to the other groups of children we were studying, we did find a significant increase in emotional and behavioral problems around age seven. And that was interesting because other studies of adoption, again, which I'm sure many of you are very familiar with, um, particularly of Dutch studies of internationally adopted children, have found a very similar thing, that around age seven, the children can experience um, an increase in problems. And in our study, we next went back at age 10, and they, were, they looked no different from the other children by then. The Dutch researchers went back at age 14 in their study, and again, the differences had disappeared. And in fact, in our study by age 14, the surrogacy children were doing incredibly well in terms of self-esteem, mental health, and so on. So it seemed in terms of trying to understand this kind of increase at age seven, the adoption researchers put it down to children having to deal with identity issues to do with being adopted to, and then because they were internationally adopted to do with looking different from their parents at an earlier age than most children begin to think a lot about identity which is closer to adolescence and I think the same could have been going on with our children born through surrogacy because you can't hide surrogacy in the same way as you know some people do through assisted reproduction so everybody knew um, you know, that that's how they came into the world. Another concern was, um, I mean, clearly there are ethical um, issues, very legitimate ones about the ways that surrogates can be treated and are treated in some parts of the world. Um, in the UK, we found, although people thought they said at the time, you know, in the late 90s, they said, well, as soon as the intended couple had the baby, they'll reject the surrogate. 
Um, but in fact, in our longitudinal study, we found that they didn't. So by age 10, that 60% of the surrogacy families were still in touch with the surrogate, and many of them had really close relationships, and their children were in touch um, with a you know, quite a diverse um, array of, of relationships. Some saw each other, like the surrogate's own children and the children she had for another couple, as family, others not, others as something a bit more distant, others really not very close at all. There was, there was quite a variation in these relationships, but generally the relationships were positive and were maintained. And we were also interested in what the surrogacy children themselves thought. Um, and again, they, well, basically as teenagers, they just weren't very interested. So Simon at age 14 said, I was talking to someone at school and they said they were an accident. I know I was really wanted, and it makes me feel special. And Chris, who was 14, said, I think it's cool. I quite like talking about it because it's an interesting fact about me. And the others would say things like, well, really, I'm not that interested. I've got you know, more, more interesting things going on in my life right now. So it just wasn't a big issue for them. Um, oh, and this is, a, and we haven't, I said we haven't finished our 21-year analysis, but just again, just looking at the interviews from the 21-year-olds, it is still very similar, um, that it's not something that is causing them a lot of distress. So, um, okay, so 85 was the first surrogacy birth in this country. 1991, um, another controversial birth, where it was um, announced that a woman who had never had a sexual relationship with a man, a single heterosexual, well, a single woman, um, I don't know how she identified, but a single woman um, had conceived a child. And um, again, this was something that caused a lot of um, outcry. Um, so this, I think, was the, or the Daily Express, why one virgin birth was enough for us all. And so they went on, these articles. So we were interested because we'd earlier studied um, children in single mother families following divorce, but this of course is very different because a lot of the concerns about single mother families for, you know, following divorce is that often the mothers move into situations where they have, there's a drop in income, um, the, also, the children have often experienced conflict between parents in the years before they separate. And quite often, mothers um, following divorce can and show increases levels of depression. And all of these have, have been found to be um, associated with increased emotional behavioral difficulties in children. But children of single mothers by choice don't experience these factors. You know, so the mothers plan to have children. They haven't gone through this sort of difficult breakup and so on. But the difference is that the children don't know the identity of their biological father if they were conceived through anonymous sperm donation. So um, we were interested in, in that. And um, we studied a group of single mothers by choice and we who had had children through donor insemination and we compared them um, with two parent heterosexual families who'd also had children through donor insemination. And we really found that the families were indistinguishable, um, they were doing fine, um, but the children were too young at that point. In the first wave of the study, they were on average about five or six. And they didn't really understand, uh, some were even younger, the, the significance of not having a father. So we then followed them up four years later um, and, in fact, Jo Lysons, who was involved in this, is sitting in the audience, so she'll be able to tell you more than, than I can about it. But we found that, you know, by this time, the children were, did understand ways in which their family was, was different, and um, they actually still maintained close relationships with their mothers, and they were, they were doing fine. Um, now, gay father families... Um, Mainly, well, so gay father families with two fathers adopting children jointly became possible in 2005. So the law changed in 2002 to allow joint adoption by same-sex parents, and that law came into force in 2005. 
and um, there was some concern about, you know, among local authorities, adoption agencies, about children who were already vulnerable being placed in gay father families. Um, and at the time, I remember um, Bath, the British Association of Adoption and Fostering, a little, just a little bit later, um, I think it was about 2008, 2009, had a conference in London to discuss this issue. Um, there was concern that perhaps fathers, men, were less suited as parents um, than, than women were. And also that gay fathers, because they may be experiencing stigmatization, um, more than lesbian mothers, that again could be problematic for the children. So in order to address these issues, we began a study um, of adoptive gay father families, adoptive lesbian mother families, and adoptive heterosexual parent families. Um, the first phase was carried out when the children on average were six years old. We found not only very high levels of positive parenting in the gay father families, but the children in the gay father families actually showed lower levels of emotional and behavioral problems. Now, we didn't know at the time whether this was because, um, because of the concerns about placing children with gay fathers that perhaps the most challenging children were not placed with them, or because the fathers um, actually were particularly good parents. These were men who'd always wanted to be parents, didn't think it was going to be an option for them. Um, and so when they did become parents, they were very involved and committed parents. So there were a number of reasons for this, but certainly um, you know, the concerns that have been raised were not, um, you know, they didn't play out in terms of the research findings. Um, we followed them up at age 12, and again, the person who did that is sitting in the audience, Anya McConaughey, who actually um, is now at UEA, studying to be a clinical psychologist here. So that's a nice um, kind of connection between the two universities. Um, and so for these children, we found no differences in the three family types, but we did find a, an increase in the psychological problems shown by these children um, at age 12. And you know, this you know, wouldn't be a surprise to, to this audience because these were all children adopted from the care system. They were all children who'd had very difficult early years um, you know, in many ways. And I, you know, it's, it's not a surprise that 50% of them had either a learning difficulty, a psychological disorder, or both. Um, and in fact, the gay fathers were coping extremely well with rather challenging children. I just want to tell you about one family. Um, so this is Dago Melvin's family. They had three children who were unrelated to each other. They adopted. Kerry was 15, her birth mother was 13, and in foster care when Kerry was born. Then there was Robert, who was 11. He was the youngest of his birth mother's 14 children. Um, his birth father had been in prison for serious crimes and was a risk to children. Robert was born with fetal alcohol syndrome, and at school he was performing at the level of a seven-year-old. And the little one, Jamie, was four. His birth mother grew up in the care system. She became pregnant when she was 18 with her 14-year-old boyfriend. Jamie was born with cerebral palsy and had impaired speech and mobility problems and behavioral difficulties. And this is what his dad said, Diego, one of his fathers. He said, it's enriched our lives. We've done amazing things. We've been on wonderful holidays, and even the little one who has cerebral palsy loves football, and he's in a special football team for children with cerebral palsy. The paces are small and tiny, but I think they're more special because they're huge steps to these kids. And then he went on to say, I'm delighted when they come in. They'll say hi, they give you a kiss, and what's for dinner? You polish their shoes, and they'll sort out their homework, and you help them where you can and you thank your lucky stars every morning that you've got these kids, and then you think, imagine if they were still in care. And so the fathers in our study were essentially, you know, really 
in, well, in fact, all of the adoptive parents were. Um, but, you know, considering how much antagonism there had been to the gay fathers, you know, they, they really were incredible. And the reality of the situation was so much, you know, contradicted the concerns that had been raised about them. We also did a study of um, gay fathers through surrogacy. Now, of course, we did this in the United States because, um, you know, it's, it's many more gay couples have had children through surrogacy there. Um, and, you know, again, we had very positive outcomes and um, these families were doing very well. But, of course, surrogacy is expensive, particularly in the US. So they were, they were wealthier families. And so some of the problems that the other families in our studies were experiencing, you know, were not, not problems for these families. Um, most recently, um, the last family type I want to mention of transparent families. Um, so, um, again, somebody here who's been involved in this, Susie Barr Brown, um, is in the audience. And this is a study we began quite recently following um, the government. Uh, a, a, a meeting they held in 2015, when again it became clear that practically nothing was known about children um, with transgender parents. So we carried out a study of 35 children, looking at mainly their experiences of a parent's gender transition. Now, again, the age at which this happened seemed to be a big factor in how children felt. But those whose parent had transitioned when they were young were generally um, very accepting about it. So Susanna, age 14, said, I don't remember when it actually happened, so it's basically been for as long as I remember. Chloe's always been Chloe. And Vicky, 12, said, he's been wearing skirts for as long as I can remember. To me, it's not strange. To someone else, maybe having a dad who wears skirts and likes pink would be weird, but to me, is perfectly normal. But for some children, it was distressing when their parent transitioned. Um, so Jade, talking about when she was six, said, when she transitioned, I felt like there was a hole in my heart because I missed my dad. But then three years later, looking back, she felt very differently about it. So at nine, she said, but when she transitioned, it made her a lot happier because when she was a boy, she was really unhappy. Ever since she's transitioned, she's come home from work, hugged us, and been really happy. It's changed a lot since she transitioned. And we also asked the children what they would like the world to know about their family. You know, if they could stand on a roof and, and shout out about their family. Mike, who was nine, said, what I'd like other people to know about our family is that we're a happy family. We're all really happy and joyful. Teresa, age 17, said, we always support each other and listen to each other, and it's just easy to be around each other. It's not that you're losing a parent, you're just gaining a different one. And Ben, 15, said, the best thing is they're mine. They're my family and not anyone else's. So, um, if we fast forward to today, um, actually, we're now in April, but I don't think anything's changed in the last few weeks. Um, we now have same-sex marriage in around 30 countries, and one in six adoptions are by same-sex couples in this country. And more than 8 million IVF babies have been born worldwide. So it might seem that that's the end of the story, but unfortunately not. So as recently as 2015, the Northern Ireland Health Minister had to resign because he said publicly gay parents are far, far more likely to abuse their children. Um, in 2019, there were demonstrations in the streets of Paris when the government um, introduced um, allowing same-sex couples to have children through assisted reproduction. And... In, also in 2019 in Birmingham, you may remember, there were protests outside primary schools objecting to the fact that children were being taught about different kinds of families. Um, so stigmatization is still a problem um, for children today, certainly not nearly as much as it was, but 
Unfortunately, there's more sort of low-level stigmatization going on. For example, using the word gay as a pejorative term, as kids often do. Um, we did, we worked with Stonewall to actually look at the experiences at school of children with same-sex parents, and they felt that, you know, their families weren't accepted. So, they, as this child said, the videos they used to show you in school, all about life and everything, it would be the conventional family with a mum, dad, kids and a dog, and it wasn't two mums and two dads, it was always a mum and a dad. Um, another child said, I can still remember when I was younger, we had to draw a medal that said, number one dad. I said, I didn't want to do it. And my teacher said, just do one, don't moan. And I found that really hard. I'm now going to, because I'm aware of the time, I'm going to flick through quite quickly. So excuse me if I miss out some slides, but I think I want to allow some time for questions. Um, this was a child who was really scared to be open about her family at school. Um, similar situation, children with trans parents say the same thing, that within their family, um, you know, things are, are fine, but it's when they go out in public with their parents that, that things that get difficult for them. Stonewall, um, the children in the Stonewall study came up with a set of recommendations about how schools could do things differently, a set of 10 recommendations. That's available on the Stonewall website. Um, and I think what's really interesting is that these came from the children themselves. Um, I've, I've mentioned along the way, and I won't say any more about that, but over the years, over the decades, this research has fed into policy and resulted um, in a number of policy changes, um, which I think has been a positive thing. It's certainly nice to see research being part of the conversation in policy making. So, um, I mean, just to kind of conclude and sum up, in studying all these different family types where, you know, different, different family structures allow you to look at different aspects of how the structure of families might affect children, really it helps us to understand more generally um, you know, how much family structure really makes a difference or doesn't. And the conclusion um, that I feel I've come to after you know, all these years of doing these studies is that the number, the gender, the gender identity, the sexual orientation and the genetic relatedness of parents matters less for children than the quality of family relationships. But what also matters is parents' openness with their children about their origins and also the attitudes of the wider society in which children live. So put another way, just because people become parents in non-conventional ways does not make them less capable parents or love their children less. In fact, it seems the opposite is true. Where differences have been found between new family forms and traditional families, these differences suggest that those who've struggled against the odds to have children become particularly involved and committed parents. And I'd just like to end with a quote from one of the children, um, whoops, in our study, Alice, who's seven, I think she sums it up beautifully when she says, I've got two parents who love me. It doesn't matter if they're a boy or a girl. Thank you. Well, Thank you, Susan. Thank you. I mean, thank you very much for. Uh, it was just a fantastic talk, wasn't it? Honestly, what an emotional roller coaster. At one minute, I was angry at what I was seeing, and the next minute, I was almost watery eyes with emotion at how what was happening in the families and the children being looked after. Thank you for that. It was fantastic. I'm sure some people must have a question. Is anyone bursting to start one off? It must be. Yes, uh, 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 hold, on, uh, hold on a moment. Having said that, 
You've got to have the mic with you so that people who are uh, attending remotely... So it gives you a chance to, to formulate your words. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I was really interested to, to hear about um, how the earlier sort of disclosures, as it, as it was said, to children who were um, within families from the unassisted pregnancies, how they sort of adjusted um, maybe sort of better than children who were told later. I was just wondering how and if that kind of has fed into how we do kind of life story work and things with our children who are in long-term fostering and adoption from a a very young age who have come from the care system and how that's kind of approached or if that's been considered um, with the work that kind of social workers do in that arena? Yes, I mean, that's an interesting question. And I think actually one that several other, pe many other people in this room are better qualified to answer than I am because, you know, I don't, I don't work in social work. Um, but I think certainly there are lots of parallels and whatever kind of family that we've been studying, um, generally, when children come from families that are a bit different, the earlier that people begin to talk to them and they feel they can ask questions in a way that's, you know, age appropriate for them and get answers that, you know, they feel, they don't feel inhibited by then asking more questions. That seemed to be something that was common to the children, all the different family types we studied. So, you know, it wasn't just that some parents said to us, oh, we told our child when they were four, and that was it. You know, whereas other parents, they would continue the conversation, and as the children grew older, they would talk to them about things in a slightly different way and perhaps give them more information and so on. Um, and that's what really, you know, seemed to make the difference. And that the children, I mean, I, I know in the adoption literature, um, you know, I feel very loath to speak about things I know many of you know much more about than I do. But in the, in the adoption literature as well, it's not just, you know, being told something. It's feeling that you can talk about it in an open way. Um, you know, that the parents don't suddenly clam up and you can tell, oh, you know, this is a bit taboo, I can't really talk about this, I can't ask this question. So it's really not just about when, but it's about how parents talk to their children, and it's really about opening up channels of communication. Mm -hmm. So I don't know so much about the specific situation that you mentioned, but I imagine some of these principles are pretty universal. Anyone else in the room, or is, is, there, is there anyone in the chat? Have you any got a comment from anyone attending remotely? If not at the moment, if you are, if, if anyone out there, anyone out there, please type type away. Yeah, person at the back. Thank you. Um, so I just kind of wanted to know a little bit more about how you felt doing all this research, because it seems like every few years there seems to be another barrier, another what if, another kind of fabrication to kind of battle against. And I just wondered, how does that feel for you, kind of being an expert? It was kind of frustrating because it, the same issues kept coming around. You think, well, we talked about that 10 years ago. But then, you know, for example, in terms of families with lesbian mothers. So first of all, it was sort of after divorce and about custody. And then it was donor insemination. The same kinds of questions came up again and again. And then it was, um, well, that was assisted reproduction. Then it was adoption and, you know, whatever new way um, that became possible to form families, then it would be like reinventing the wheel over and over again. So a bit frustrating, I suppose, is, <laughs> is the predominant reaction, but yes. The person here, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's really interesting because I was going to ask you almost exactly the same question, but I'm going to say something else. And I was going to start my question with thanking you because um, I heard you speak many years ago and was very moved by 
your um, commitment really to to effect change and so and you have effected change that impact on policy is you know you should leave that slide up longer in, in my view because it's actually very difficult to change policy especially when there's so much resistance so I was going to ask you how much resistance you have encountered and um, in a way you were asked a question more generally about about resistance so I'm going to ask and you were very um, I felt very generous in your response but actually it's extremely difficult to even publish some of this work um, and I wondered whether you have experienced those that those kinds of barriers less so perhaps now but in those early days mm -hmm. even publishing something with the word lesbian in it would have been extremely difficult mm -hmm. I've published myself and have experienced quite a number of barriers, it takes, it takes me a long time to get things published. You could say that's because I'm not a very good academic, but I don't think that's true, but I'm, 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 open, to, I'm open to discuss that. <laughs> so really it was a thank you, mm. and tell us a little bit more about the resistance, perhaps in the early days around, around publishing. I think that's an important mm. um, consideration. Yes, um, well, as you were talking, first of all, I should say that, you know, I hadn't done this research myself. I've worked with an amazing team of people, um, you know, some of whom have been working with me for decades, some of whom I'm delighted to say are here today. Um, so, you know, this couldn't have been done by one person. It, you know, has been a whole lot of us over the years and people coming in with their own particular interests and expertise and so on. But yes, in the, I mean, as you were talking, an image came into my mind of in the early days with the custody cases, once I did this research, then I would be asked to be an expert witness in custody cases, which I would do. And I remember, and it was difficult, and I would be cross-examined on, you know, just about every single aspect of the research. But there was one particular psychiatrist who clearly, you know, had his own view of things um, and wasn't willing to put... I mean, I think probably being young and female didn't help either because it was usually older male psychiatrists and certainly much older male judges in these days. But um, I remember one, and he was being, you know, in, in the witness box, being cross-examined, and he held up my very first paper... And he waved it in the air and he said, this research isn't worth the paper it's written on. So it was kind of like that in the early days. But in some ways I was lucky. So in these very early custody cases, um, the expert witness for the mother in the first few was somebody that some of you may have heard of, was um, Sir Michael Rutter, who was a very recently passed away, sadly, but very, very well-respected child psychiatrist. And he, um, he was the one in the early cases who was, who was arguing for the importance of family relationships. And he was very frustrated about the fact that there was no research, no empirical evidence, because he was having to fight with you know, people coming, as I mentioned, for a very psychoanalytic background and just with such, you know, arguing with such conviction that these children were going to grow up to be very psychologically damaged and dis disturbed. So he, um, oh, I, w I won't go into the details, but he got to hear of my research on lesbian mother families. And because, you know, he was a real, um, you know, empirically minded person through and through, um, then he then um, he got in touch and said, if you want to continue with this research, I think it's important, I can help you. It started, as I mentioned, as a master's project, but he said, I can help you get some research funding to develop this. And that actually just made all the difference. Um, and then the early work, because he was involved, his name was on the paper, and of course that helped get it published, because, you know, I was very young um, and not, you know, very inexperienced and so on. So that's kind of what it was like in the early days. But, you know, when I started to study assisted reproduction families, similar things happened. And I remember sending one article to 
the Journal of Adolescence, and it was the first study of IVF adolescence, and it was sent back to say, oh, we know all about these families now, you know, why are you sending this rubbish to, to us, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I mean, even as I've, I've grown older, um, you know, sometimes you do get bad reviews, and you just go somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Has anyone, has anyone typed in anything online or not? Okay. In that case, time is moving on. I think I only have time for one question. I think this person has moved on. Perhaps a bit of... Susan, thank you so much for a wonderful lecture. You have the quality of making very complicated things sound simple. <laughs> They're not simple, but they come over as very understandable. I'm going to ask you, right at the very end, you talk about the fact that parents from families which are... Uh, with the, the, the creating the new family structure you're talking about. The children are interesting to me, and I was wondering whether you're doing research on children speaking to children, because a child from a parent that may be prejudiced can become prejudiced. doesn't matter whereabouts the parent is on the spectrum you're talking about. Is there a way that you're thinking about that maybe allow children to become ambassadors of that social change, which you're still touching on, is around the whole phenomenon? of what you're discussing? That's a really interesting question. Um, it's not something we've done, unless I'm forgetting something. <laughs> I don't think so. It's not something we've done. I mean, a lot of researchers, psychology, don't actually even speak to the children, so we kind of have been patting ourselves on the back a bit for always interviewing children, not just parents. But what you're suggesting is something... Um, well, in, in a more, something that's even more liberal, I suppose. And I think it certainly resonates with this move towards having stakeholders involved in research these days. And I know in, um, you know, other areas of developmental research that children and adolescents are involved right from the beginning in terms of planning studies. So, but I think um, involving children in doing the research and interviewing each other is a really... I mean, other people have done it. We haven't. But it doesn't happen a lot, but I think it's a really fruitful way forward and very interesting. So um, let those in my team who are here take that back with them and mull it over. But, yeah, I think that would produce something a bit different and more nuanced and maybe even a bit more honest than speaking to adults. So thank you for that question. <laughs> Thank you very much. I am going to bring the, the sort of formal part to a, a close now. For those of you who are here in the room, there's an opportunity uh, to mingle afterwards, uh, uh, have a glass of wine or a soft drink. Anyone at home, please have a drink. Um, <laughs> and uh, there's also uh, copies of Susan's book, and Susan will be there to, to have a chat. And so if you have any more questions, you can catch up with her in person. Again, Susan, thank you so much for a really, really inspiring talk. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for coming.